It's great to be here. I have to say, I wasn't sure what this was going to be like. Uh, as I've said to a number of people, uh, I knew Obi, and he was like the only person in this room, I think, that I had met personally face-to-face -face before uh, showing up here. So uh, there was a mix of anticipation and terror, I suppose. Uh, but it's really been wonderful. I've had great conversations with any number of people. I hope you all will forgive me if I don't have everyone's name straight, because I, I would probably not pass that exam. But... Uh, this is going to be, you know, kind of a, uh, I suspect, um, in some ways, a introduction to another set, a way of thinking about, or, or another realm of writing by Mennonites. Uh, and uh, I'll start by just uh, talking about, these are some books, this is my bookshelf in my office, and some of the uh, Mennonite related books that are that I have on my shelf and uh, the great thing about it now is that there's too much for any one person to really have read all of it and know all of it uh, even if you tr have tried which I have kind of tried um, that's the great thing and the problem so there's a lot that we might talk about let's see okay there we go so I want to say just a little bit uh, biographically. Um, I grew up in central Illinois. My family had been there for several generations. My ancestors on both sides were mostly Mennonite, came in the uh, early 19th century, uh, settled there, uh, came as Amish people, really. I was telling somebody about this at lunch. And then in the 19th century, many of the Mennonites in Illinois, many of those Amish families and uh, churches um, over a period of time became Mennonite and formed their own conferences and then joined up with either the General Conference or what we used to call the Old Mennonites. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is my great grandpa George who was a Mennonite preacher in Illinois in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, this is his wife Claire, though they weren't married yet then. And these are his sisters and a few other uh, friends and relatives. And uh, you can see you know, this was probably taken around 1900 or so. Now, these people were staunch Mennonites. I mean, they were, you know, they did not think of themselves as liberal by any means. But you can see they're pretty well duded out, right? I mean, they're fancily dressed, yeah? Uh, and George has this little uh, pin on it, button on it. Uh, I'm not sure what's on it, but anyhow. So um, that's one side of the family. Um, and this is actually also uh, on my dad's side. This is my grandpa and grandma, and my dad is the one whose face is kind of half hidden there behind his uh, younger brother Dick. Uh, their family, uh, they lived in Graymont, Illinois, most of uh, my dad's growing up years. Uh, and again, staunch Mennonites, they were general conference, which George was uh, also. Um, and again, they were like regular Americans, right? So plain dress was not really a thing uh, on that side of my line um, in the 20th century. Okay, this is uh, my grandparents on the other side, Art and Ella Ringenberg and a whole bunch of their grandchildren. Uh, take a guess, which one's me? Some of you can't see this very well. I'm, I'm the squinting, <laughs> awkward boy who's trying not to close my eyes because the camera, the, the sun is in them. Uh, at this point. This is my sister, and these are all my first cousins. Um, so this was taken in the, oh, probably around 1960, early 60s, uh, and so forth. So um, I grew up in a, the Waldo Mennonite Church, which was uh, old Mennonite, uh, because my mother grew up in that church. My dad went to the General Conference Church, which was 10 miles away, and Waldo was four miles away. So, um, but it was a pretty uh, congenial sort of uh, relationship between the, the OMs and the GCs in that part of uh, Illinois at that point anyway. We did things with the uh, others from the youth group. We had relatives that were in those other churches and, you know, we're on, we're on good terms with them. Um, the other thing that had happened by the time that I came along was that most of the young people were going off to college. And that came to, there was this pretty big shift. My parents, my dad went for a year and then came home, was not really excited about it. My mother would have loved to go to college, would have done very well, I think. But her father didn't think women need to be educated. You know, some of uh, us in this room have heard that line still, I, I suspect. And so um, after a year, he came home, they got married, started farming, and I grew up 
grew up on the farm with them. But uh, when it's time to go to college, I went off to Goshen, uh, that den of liberal iniquity, which probably some of you have heard about. Uh, and it was that way then, and it still is, you know, or no, well, no. Uh, I actually had a great experience there, learned a lot, decided to become a poet, or at least try to, and uh, all of that stuff. Um, so that's just a little background. Um, when I started writing, I didn't think of Mennonite poets and writers. Uh, let's see here. There's one more. Okay, there he is. All right. Um, I didn't know any other Mennonite writers except for, you know, some of my fellow students and so forth. Even the poetry teacher at Goshen uh, was an imported Presbyterian, you know. Um, and uh, so, but in about 1982 or so, I was teaching at Heston in Kansas, and this guy on the, your, uh, on my right here, Keith Rasliff, called me up on the phone, and he was there for uh, part of the summer teaching a poetry class, and it turns out he was going to grad school at Indiana University where I had gone, and uh, he said, I hear you're a poet. Uh, let's get together. So we got together for, for an evening and had a great conversation, and he became a fast friend and uh, is still, still one of my closest friends. Uh, a little bit later, I met Jean Jansen, who is uh, a little older than me, at the Mennonite World Conference in Winnipeg in 1990. Was anybody here there at that point? Most of you weren't even born then, so no. Um, Jean uh, had an interesting track. She's Mennonite brethren, uh, grew up in various parts of the United States, lived in Fresno much most of her grown-up life now. And uh, she had four children, and her husband's a was a pediatrician, and so she stayed home, raised the kids, and then when they were in school, she went back to college, uh, got a degree, started studying poetry seriously, decided she wanted to be a writer, and uh, has published numbers of books since then. Um, one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is the uh, amongst these Mennonite writers, there's a real range of uh, relation to the church of their youth uh, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, Keith uh, is was sort of a Quaker for a while. Um, he would be one of those who, you know, doesn't show up on Sunday morning anywhere very often. Uh, as we'll see a little later, his work is still kind of startlingly religious, I think. Uh, Jean has stayed with the Mennonite Brethren Church, uh, bless her heart, all these years, and, uh, you know, been frustrated by it sometimes, been uh, cherished and, and uh, encouraged sometimes as well. And, uh, yeah, um, this is Julia Spiker Kasdorf, who's a native Pennsylvanian. Does anybody know, do people here know her work? Some of you do. Um, I met her uh, about that same time in the early 90s, uh, when she, about the time that she published her first book, which was called Sleeping Preacher, and it's, it's largely a book about her uh, family. Uh, her dad left the Amish church when he was about 10. Uh, the family's roots are in Big Valley, Pennsylvania, in that, that part of the, of the state. And uh, so she grew up going back there for summers, staying with her uh, relatives and, you know, hearing all these stories. So this book kind of made a big splash. It won the Pitt Poetry Series, which is one of the uh, pretty prestigious first book awards still in, in American poetry. Uh, two of the poems, or two or three of the poems in it appeared in The New Yorker. You know, this is like miraculous success for a Mennonite. And, uh, well, in my circles at least, it's... Uh, it's kind of a remarkable thing when Mennonites have success in the world. We all suddenly go, oh, wow, they must be smart or something. You know, they must be important or, or whatever. And, and so that happened to Julia. And, and she is smart. And she is a, a really interesting and fine poet. Uh, this picture was taken. And here's, she's here with Ann Hostetler, who's uh, also a poet and editor, who I'll talk about a bit more later. Um, this is a pretty terrible picture, Julia. She would hate it if she knew I was showing this to you. But this was taken uh, at the 2006 uh, Mennonites Writing Conference in Bluffton. And so I, I want to talk a bit more about those conferences along the way. And uh, so that's partly why uh, this is 
this is in here. So anyway, uh, I started to find in this time in the in the 90s and uh, onward that there were these other Mennonite writers that were doing really interesting things. Um, I found myself corresponding with, getting together with, um, talking about each other's poems, sending work back and forth, and that has continued to be a really uh, important and uh, valuable thing for me personally. Uh, and um, there's developed this kind of network amongst Mennonite uh, writers. Um, and again, when I'm saying Mennonite here, I'm really talking about uh, the kind of more progressive wings of, of the church, I suppose. Yeah? Although there's some interaction with other folks, but, but really less than there should be, I think. And this is, this is one of the reasons I'm here. You know, as the goodwill ambassador, I suppose, or, some, or something unofficial. I've not been appointed by any church uh, agency, so don't worry about that. Uh, so this is this is a photo from the uh, that 2006 conference. It's kind of dark up here. Uh, some of you probably know John Ruth, and that is John Ruth uh, up there, eminent Pennsylvania uh, Mennonite church figure, and his wife Roma. Um, this is. Uh, Nicely, I'm blanking on his first name. Uh, I'll remember. What? No. Uh, his son Lamar uh, teaches at Bluffton. Uh, man, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, he was for years uh, chair of the English department at Messiah College and is retired now. And uh, Mennonite figures, anyway. So um, there have been a series of these conferences. The first one was at Conrad Grable University in, uh, in Canada in 1990. And then there were two at Goshen, uh, one at Bluffton, uh, one in Winnipeg, one at Eastern Mennonite, one at Fresno. Uh, the next one is going to be in 2020 at uh, Goshen again. And so uh, there's a call for papers and proposals out now. And I really hope to see some of you folks uh, who are here today there then. I think it would be a great opportunity. Uh, typically, two or 300 people have come out to these things. Uh, there are readings and papers and panels of all sorts. Uh, really a great time just to connect with people and see what's, what's going on. All right. So uh, with that as sort of preface, I want to start uh, to talk a bit about some of these writers and some of the ways their work's been received and, and so forth. Uh, Rudy Weeb, how many people know that name? Uh, many of you do. Uh, was kind of the first modern Mennonite writer to make a big splash, uh, in uh, Canada at least. His first novel, Peace Shall Destroy Many, was published in 1962, or 60, yeah, I think 62. It's about this uh, Mennonite village uh, during World War II. Uh, they have this big peace ideology, of course. Uh, the young men are not going off to war. They're doing alternative service instead. Uh, what turns up in the course of the novel uh, is that it's also a community that's rigidly authoritarian, that does not treat the women well, uh, in which uh, the leaders uh, really um, do not act with uh, great charity and grace toward everyone else in the in the community at times, and in which it turns out that that you know peace uh, is a problematic concept, right? So this book came out, caused a lot of controversy and stir amongst the MBs, especially at the time. Uh, Rudy was the uh, editor of the MB Herald, which is the main magazine then for uh, Canadian Mennonite brethren, and uh, he was basically forced to resign from that position. He, uh, to his credit, I think, did not leave the church, uh, but found a job, eventually taught at Goshen College for a couple of few years, and then got a job at the University of Edmonton, where he stayed for many years. He's written dozens of books by now, but he's part of the MB Church. He remains uh, a voice that's both um, celebratory at times and uh, critical at times and has stayed engaged in a way that I think is is pretty remarkable and, and has become, I mean, amongst Canadian authors, he would be one of the, oh, 10 or 20 names that a lot of people would mention amongst prominent Canadian writers uh, still today. Uh, his uh, second novel, 
uh, I think it's the second novel, Blue Mountains of China, is sort of an epic about the travels and travails of uh, Mennonites in uh, Ukraine uh, during the Russian Revolution and afterwards. I don't know how many people know that story here. It's not particularly the, the, the kinship group that most of the folk here come from, I think. Um, we could say a whole lot about that too. It happens my wife is an MB from Vancouver. So I have, I have learned all about this uh, in a variety of ways uh, since. So following uh, Rudy um, then, many more, many more things have followed. All right, I've got a few uh, quotes here from a variety of sources asking whether Mennonite art is really even possible. All right, you're laughing, you're laughing. But in some people's minds, this was a serious question. Okay, so this is, uh, this is Harold Bender in the Mennonite Encyclopedia. Uh, how many people here know who Harold Bender is? Yeah, okay. Um, and he said, this was in the 50s sometime, there are those who doubt whether much great art can be produced in a group which has a strict standard of Christian morals and a strong sense of separation from the world. There are also those who hold that the autonomy of art is a danger to a truly profound religious experience and that one or the other must be sacrificed. Okay, so, so the basic argument here is that you can't be a Mennonite and an artist because the art is bound to uh, conflict with the church in one way or another. Um, now, I don't know, I think Dante, for instance, would have seen this as a problematic argument, do, do you think? Uh, John Milton, I think, would not have accepted this as, a, as an argument, although none of the, neither of them were exactly orthodox in their, in their work either. Um, Bach, you know? All right. So, but this, this is a pretty long-standing position amongst, amongst Mennonites, and, and one that I heard uh, sometimes as well. Uh, here's another uh, more recent skeptical view from Calvin Redekop, who's a, a Mennonite sociologist. And it, it's a s kind of similar. A central dilemma of Mennonite society is that self-conscious reflection by way of the arts and through giving free and creative reign to the intellectual impulse eats at the very heart of the sectarian commitment. The intellectual and aesthetic impulse nurtured both in the process of handing on the tradition and in the process of whatever, no, 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 okay. Uh, tends, however, to question both the freedom of aesthetic and intellectual experience that is craved by many, if not most, Mennonites. They well prove to sound the death knell for the Mennonite ethos and reality. Okay, that's even more foreboding, is it not? Basically, I think, my paraphrase of this, this is sort of a skeptical paraphrase, I will confess, is that he seems to be saying that you can't think very much about being Mennonite, because if you do, it won't make sense, and you won't be able to believe it anymore. You know, you'll have to give it up. Now, again, this, this seems really depressing to me on, you know, on a number of levels, right? If the only way that you can believe what you believe is by not asking questions about it, um, Okay, you get, what I, you get where I'm going. All right. Um, he, he, there's another part of this where he says that um, the proper role for Mennonite artists might be like uh, artists in Soviet society where everything they did was controlled by the government. <laughs> you know, which seems even more, uh, I, I don't know, uh, authoritarian to me. Yeah, so I, I critiqued this uh, statement in, in one of my prose books, and I got a note from him uh, accusing me of being proud. Um, <laughs> and I wrote back, and I just said that I did not not uh, really think that it was being proud to uh, question this, but all right. So um, some statements of various kinds of determination sort of in the face of this, this headwind. This comes from John Ruth. John Ruth in 1970-something, uh, 78, he delivered a series of lectures at the Bethel College campus. And they've had this series going on, uh, well, at least this long. It's still going on. Um, on the subject of Mennonite identity and literary art. And this, this little pamphlet that was published afterwards, uh, there's a copy of it amongst the books out there. Uh, it's a fascinating document. You know, John Ruth is no liberal. Right, he's no he's no flaming uh, anything goes kind of guy, um, but so this is how 
uh, he asked, one of the questions he asked about how Mennonites might make literary art. How often has there been an aesthetically serious representation of our ethos and its classic issues, obedience, simplicity, humility, defenselessness, the questioning of progress, the maintenance of identity, that did not veer into sentimental advocacy or irritable expose. Yeah. yeah, now that's a, you know, that's a pretty great question, isn't it, right? Because a lot of uh, Mennonite writing, a lot of uh, religious writing in general, I think, does one of those two things. Either it's the sort of, oh, this is why we've got to believe the way we do, uh, in a way that seems kind of sentimental, or it's the, this is terrible and we've got to get out of here, you know, we've got to, we've got to throw it all over. And, and what he's calling for, really, is something that's neither of those things, but that's, that's kind of an aesthetically serious representation. He used the word grappling uh, in another passage, which, you know, uh, people have critiqued uh, this document since, including me. Um, but there is, I, I still appreciate, you know, the way that he takes all of this on. Back to Rudy Weeb. Uh, this is another kind of startling quote that I found. Uh, and it accounts for a lot of Rudy's practice. He's, he's tended to write these big kind of sweeping novels, uh, ambitious novels. Now, of course, he's MB, right? The MBs are always ambitious so, and, uh, in, in a variety of ways. Uh, but he says, a poem, a lyric will not do. Uh, he's thinking really about writing about the Mennonite experience and especially about the whole migration from the Ukraine to Canada, to South America, various places and all that uh, trauma and uh, stuff that happened. You must lay great black steel lines of fiction, break up that space with huge design, and build giant artifacts. No song can do that. It must be giant fiction. Yeah. Now, I mean, I kind of admi I admire this ambition. At the same time, you know, I never found that I had the capacity to write a novel myself, so I've kind of slunk around uh, this uh, my entire writing life. So, yeah, what do you do? OK, here's another view of the problem. Um, Di Brand, whom I'll talk about at several points here, does people know that name? Uh, writer, uh, poet from uh, Manitoba, grew up in one of those villages. Uh, her family was not just Mennonite brethren, but some splinter group that was even more strict than most of them. And uh, so uh, she spent much of her life kind of writing in this uh, in some form or another of opposition to uh, the kind of repression and uh, difficulty that she experienced uh, growing up. At the same time, being appreciative of it in many ways. So yeah, I hate having to choose between my inherited identity and my life, traditional Mennonite versus contemporary Canadian woman writer, yet how can I be both and not fly apart? The new Mennonite writing exists as transgression, a violation of the authority of God and the Bible and the Father, begins to give a voice to the children and women silenced by the tradition. What the new Mennonite poetry does is to bring the story home, back to earth, where hurt is really hurt and death is really death and desire is really and truly desire. Now, this, is, this is really interesting and I recommend her work uh, to, to you all, uh, both her books of poems and her, uh, she's written a number of essays, a couple of collections of, of essays that are also fascinating. Her first book was called Questions I Asked My Mother, and there are these fascinating conversation poems in there, uh, some of them with her mother, but even the most intense ones are with her father, in which she's raising, you know, uh, asking these innocent questions about why things in the Bible seem to conflict. And what is her father's response? I mean, it's, the, it's, the, it's the authoritarian, it's that way because it's that way, and you should just not ask so many questions about it kind of, kind of response. Yeah? And uh, so all of that... Uh, all of that trouble, yeah. She also got in a lot of trouble with her home community and, his, and her family. And it's actually kind of a tragic story. She's still rather estranged from uh, many of those folks. Um, this is not the only uh, trajectory, but it is one of those. Uh, this is from a book called Dancing Naked. 
narrative strategies for writing across centuries. Even the title, even the titles of these things, you know. Julia Castor's second book was called Eve's Striptease. Oh yeah, this, this is from Maggie Redekop, uh, who's a, a literary critic uh, from, from Toronto, also Canadian. Mennonite historians sometimes remind me of an elderly bride who gazes into her mirror and says to herself, I am the fairest of all churches. We are so busy admiring ourselves that we may not notice that the position of the husband has been usurped by an abusive tyrant. <laughs> Okay, she's not pulling any punches here either. If the imagination is denied, all that's left, this is kind of, in a way, uh, speaking back to uh, what Calvin Redekop was saying, all that's left is to communicate religious vision is the feeble voice of reason. The best it can come up with is a ridiculous tyrant in the sky. You know the one I mean. He's the man with the white beard waggling his finger at us all. He's the man who has a reason for everything he does. Blake called this product of reason Nabu Daddy and viewed it as a form of idolatry. So, I mean, what many of these writers and critics, uh, what, what their project really is, as I see it, is not uh, so much a critique of Christianity or even of Mennonitism in a sort of global way, but of certain expressions of it that they've experienced, right? Um, and I have this sort of thesis about this, which I've uh, never developed fully, but uh, my one theory I have about it also is that the uh, sort of way people feel about the church and all of that as they mature has a lot to do with their particular family life and what their father was like and what the local church that they attended was like. You know? uh, my father was not a tyrant. The church I went to was conservative but not tyrannically so. And so my experience of all that stuff was nowhere near as harsh as uh, some of these other folk. And, um, you know, which is not to deny their stories, but to say, and one of the things I think is important is that we need, we need a lot of these stories. We need all of these stories to be told and for people to speak honestly out of what, what they've experienced and what they know. Okay. And another. Oh, yeah. So, this is from Julia Kasdorf, and this is uh, entering into a sort of another uh, theme that's often found in, in uh, the Mennonite writing that's uh, come out in the last few decades. Now, this is from a book of essays of hers. This particular one's called Writing Like a Mennonite, and this is really an account of being uh, abused by a neighbor uh, during her childhood. And she describes this part that's not here, how this guy would see her after school and say, come in, I want to show you my dictionary or something or other, and how uh, she felt sort of compelled. This is when she's about 10 to 12, something like that, to go in, and, and he would back her up against the wall and kiss her and force his tongue into her mouth, you know. And, um, and here's her response to this. When the man was done, I would let his wood-framed cellar door slam shut, walk home through the backyards, thinking, well, that was not so bad. It was only my body. I think that the martyr stories taught me that wonderful splintering trick. It is only the body. Writing is a process by which suppressed feelings come to consciousness. The wound becomes a mouth that finally speaks its testimony, thereby transforming a mute, confused victim into a subject with a clear vision of her experience and a literate voice. Now, so our argument here is really that in the telling of these stories, difficult and painful as there are, uh, there's a kind of healing that can take place personally, and that you know the community needs to hear these stories and reckon with them uh, as well. Okay, one more, one more. But yeah, so okay. Mennonites like to take from everyone and give back only to each other, only to themselves. They don't know how to say thank you properly to their many friends and neighbors or how to enter into properly dialogic and reciprocal relations with others. Now, we may take this as a bold generalization that is not universally true, which I don't think it is, but maybe it is sometimes true. This kind of dynamic builds up resentment against us, risks plunging us back into ethnic fear, and the deep-seated martyr complex that inflects our historical understanding of ourselves. The way we'd like to tell it, we were the innocent ones, the disliked ones, the hated ones, 
hounded, hounded from one inhospitable landscape to another. But of course, we have been the displacers as much as the displaced. So another thing, perhaps, that we ought to ponder. OK, so I have just a few categories of the kinds of Mennonite writing that uh, I'm going to try to touch on briefly. Some of the categories. All right, so, so you've got sort of epics of the tribe, right? Uh, big books, mostly novels, that try to tell the story of some segment of the people over some span of history. Uh, Rudy Weeb's Blue Mountains of China is one of those. Uh, some of his other books do similar kinds of things. Uh, Al Reimer, also Canadian, wrote a book called My Harp is Turned to Mourning about the uh, Russian Revolution and the Mennonite experience during that and people coming to Canada. Um, Dallas Weeb, who is a fascinating writer, uh, wrote a book called Our Asian Journey. Um, there was a group of these Russian Mennonites who, uh, under the influence of a sort of prophet named Klaus Epp. Do you know this story about Klaus Epp? They, you know this story? Yeah. They decided, he decided that the end of the world was near and that they should sell everything that they owned and, and make a trek into Central Asia to await the second coming. And so they did this. Several hundred people followed him there uh, into what is now one of the stands. Which stand is it? Kazakhstan, I think. Um, and of course, it all went fine. Well, with some complications until the end of the world didn't happen. And then they had to figure out what to do. And uh, <laughs> Dallas wrote this fascinating novel about that journey and uh, about then the return or, of some of those folks, some of whom ended up in Kansas, including uh, his own people. Uh, there's a line in there that goes something like, when you've been to Samarkand, Newton isn't much. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Um, and John Ruth probably, uh, of course, written a number of historical uh, books. Uh, has anybody seen his uh, history of the Lancaster Conference? It's like 1,200 pages long. It's like the thickest uh, single volume book that I own, I think. It's just monumental. It's got everything in it, all kinds of stories. Yeah. There's a great story in there about a congregation that got into a serious conflict over whether the preaching should happen from a lectern or a podium. And someone actually broke into this church uh, during this controversy and stole whichever one it was they didn't like and uh, hid it away. So then they had to use the other one the next Sunday, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure the Lord up above was uh, either gratified or dismayed by this, because I'm sure God has an opinion on that, right? You know, God knows what one of those is right and one of them is wrong, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, all right, side point. Um, so uh, there are acts of resistance, some of which we've seen uh, already. Uh, Di Brandt's uh, early work especially was in that vein. Uh, she's, her career and her writing have taken a number of interesting turns uh, since then. Um, Patrick Friesen is another uh, poet from uh, Manitoba. Uh, his first really prominent book was called The Shunning. Uh, it's an account of someone in Mennonite community who gets shunned for being insufficiently uh, orthodox. Um, but it's really also about his brother, who is you know, more at ease with things. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not an entirely uh, one-sided critique of the community. There are lots of other books like this. There's one like, called Flamethrowers. It was written sometime like the 1930s. Uh, which is really harsh and bitter. You, know? uh, you can call these kiss it goodbye novels. That's, that's what I sometimes call them. You know, the people who've just been, who are just so angry that all they want to do is you know, tell terrible stories about the bad things that were done to them by almost always men in the, in the church and how, how delighted they are to get out of it. And then you have lyrical explorations, which are typically much more... Uh, complicated and nuanced in, in a variety of ways. Well, and then what else? Oh, yeah. Then we have the spectacular successes, the Mennonite writers who suddenly become bestsellers, right? This happened with Miriam Taves in Canada, who's now widely regarded as one of the sort of uh, leading Canadian 
uh, novelists. Her latest book got reviewed in the New Yorker, uh, the New York Times. The New York, Time you know, what? Time magazine. Time, Mag Time magazine. I don't think I saw that one. All over the place, yeah. Um, Rhoda Jansen had a bestseller a few uh, years ago with a book called Mennonite in a Little Black Dress. I have a little quote from her uh, a little further on here, too. Uh, and then there's others, yeah, and we'll talk a bit about some of those as, as we have time. Uh, one of the things that's happened in Mennonite writing in the last few years is uh, uh, sort of speculative fiction by Mennonite writers, some science fiction, uh, fantasy, uh, a variety of things like that, and, and really interesting stuff. I, I actually uh, edited a special issue of the Journal of Mennonite Writing uh, with a number of texts in that vein in it, uh, which you can all look up on the web too. Uh, memoirists, uh, yeah, memoir is a big genre everywhere these days, and there are Mennonite memoirs of considerable interest. Um, LGBTQ writing has been one of those things that's uh, sort of emerged, uh, I don't know if belatedly or not, but, but there are a number of Mennonite writers and Mennonite connected writers now who are sort of uh, telling those stories and talking about their uh, experiences and writing fiction and so forth. And then, yeah, the lions and the tigers and the bears, of course, uh, as well. Uh, so here are a few proposals that I put out in uh, a book that I wrote uh, called Songs from an Empty Cage, which is uh, deals with a number of Mennonite writers and a number of uh, issues in the area that uh, I, I think I, the term theopoetics, are people familiar, how many people here are familiar with that term? Yeah, some folks. Okay, um, just for those who aren't, just briefly, um, it sort of has to do with uh, approaching theological questions uh, through poetic means, right? Uh, so what we were talking about last night, what Kyle was talking about, uh, what's the, what was the last category that he had? Uh, started with a figure, yeah, the figuralist way of reading scripture would be approaching a kind of theopoetic approach. So that uh, metaphor, narrative, um, imagery would be uh, more foregrounded and sort of producing uh, lists of propositions and attempting to find rational systems uh, for thinking about theological questions would be less in the foreground. And I've gotten really interested in this over the last several years. So there's some of that in this book too. Um, so here are just some proposals that I put forward. And um, I'll, I'll toss these out and then I'll pause to see uh, if you want to drive me out of the room or, or whatever. Um, okay, our most cherished traditions, religious, poetic, and other, all have their origins in transgression opposition to received wisdom, uh, rebellion. Arguable, all right, but there it is. All right, so that's one. Uh, these rebellions eventually become themselves ensconced in often stultifying traditions. I can't believe I used the word ensconced, but, but there it is. Um, the glints and gleams of the best are distributed widely and irregularly amongst the vast human enterprise but often to be found in the particularly charged language products we call poetry, fiction, essay. As we search for what will allow the project of life to persist and to thrive, reason and evidence are essential and yet not enough. We cannot pursue truth without beauty. All right, um, mentioned just a few more novels here. Uh, Merle Good, who's a noted Eastern Pennsylvania uh, figure, wrote one of the early uh, Mennonite novels called Happy as the Grass Was Green. People know this book still? Um, it was actually made into a movie then and uh, in the early 70s. And the people who made the movie thought the title sounded like a drug reference. And so they insisted <laughs> on it being renamed. This is a true story. So the movie is called Hazel's People. And uh, then when the book was reissued, it was, all, it was also uh, retitled. This is actually a line from a uh, poem by Dylan Thomas. Uh, so there was, there was, it was not a drug reference in Merle's mind, I'm quite sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, and this is a fairly uh, 
uh, affirmative uh, story about a young man who, uh, a sort of outsider who's got all kinds of troubles and comes into a Mennonite community and takes a job with the family and uh, there's Hazel and you know, they kind of, uh, they have this relationship but it never becomes, uh, it's not like uh, witness or anything, you know, it's not that sort of thing. Um, and eventually he sort of has a change of heart and uh, a salvation experience and so forth. Um, so yeah, that, that was one early thing. Um, oh yeah, I mentioned Dallas Weeby's uh, uh, Asian Journey, his, his uh, earlier novel, which is uh, much more in the Kiss, kiss Me Goodbye um, category. Uh, and this is his title, you know, Sky Blue the Badass. Yeah, and it's, it's really very much about a young man uh, discovering that he can actually leave the community behind, the sort of uh, oppressive Mennonite community. Dallas had this fascinating journey over the course of his life. For much of it, he was really estranged from the church. And then uh, near the end, after he'd retired, he lived in Cincinnati. I got to know him somewhat well. He... Uh, he had this real turn, and he wrote several uh, little chapbooks of really devotional poems uh, near the last uh, several years of his life. It's kind of startling to people who knew him, because everybody, when I first met him, everybody said, oh, Dallas, he's, he's like the most cynical person in the world. and He's always going down to the bar after class and drinking till closing time and you know he's he's an interesting writer but he's crazy and and he he had this uh, I don't know if it was a redemption experience or what but but ended up doing this this later really interesting stuff um, yeah I have to read I, I mentioned earlier that I was at this uh, world conference in Winnipeg in 1990 and there was a section a couple of sessions there devoted to uh, poets and fiction writers and so forth and uh, Di Brandt was there, and she read this poem called uh, Non-Resistance or Love Mennonite Style. The whole poem is on this handout. But I heard her read this poem uh, in a trembling voice and uh, in a way that uh, I, I will just never forget the sort of intensity and uh, sense of, uh, I don't know, vulnerability and determination in her in her voice as she as she read it, um, and it's a poem about really uh, from the point of view of a woman who's being abused by by a relative. Yeah, you know? and so there's a I, I won't read the whole poem, but the part we have here is is the end of the poem. Uh, you understand how love is like a knife, and a daughter is not a son, and the only way you will be saved is by submitting quietly in your grandfather's house, your flesh smoldering in the darkened room as you love your enemy deeply, unwillingly, and full of shame. So, a poem like this, and you can see, you know, there's a certain continuity between this poem and the passage from Julia's essay that we looked at earlier, also about being assaulted, um, that if we have this ethic of nonviolence and peace and submission and forgiveness and all of that, does that mean, you know, that victims of abuse should just take it, you know, should just be abused? I mean, that has often been in practice the, the, the result, I mean, what actually happened. And so, you know, in a poem like this, you get just that question put out here in a way that I mean I find really moving and troubling and uh, yeah. And again, it's you know it's a speaking of truths that have been kept quiet, and that's that's one kind of uh, transgression, I suppose, is to say things out loud that people in power don't want you to say, don't want you to talk about. Um, okay, some American poets then. I mentioned uh, Jean and uh, Julia already. Here are a couple of uh, their books. I was involved um, with editing uh, Jean's book, What the Body Knows, uh, which came out from uh, Cascadia Press, which is run by Michael King, who's a Pennsylvania guy. I don't know if you know his name or not. has a, a series uh, called Dream Seeker, uh, of uh, 
poetry, fiction. We've done a book or two of uh, nonfiction uh, as well. And I've been the general editor of that for some time now. We've done probably a dozen or 15 uh, books, mostly poetry, uh, often first or second books by uh, younger writers who are trying to get started. Uh, it's been pretty exciting. Uh, in Jean's case, um, she found herself in need of a publisher, and we did this book. Um, yeah, uh, so this is Julia's third book called Poetry in America. And one of the things that had we time, it would be fascinating to explore in the, in the semester long version of this lecture. You know, we would read all these books or a number of these books and explore them in detail. Um, one of the fascinating things is to watch writers, the sort of trajectory of their careers. And uh, Julia's has been extremely interesting. As has, as of many of these others, um, but her work seems to have gotten uh, consi consistently sort of more and more engaged with uh, the world and with larger uh, issues. And I mean, the, just the title "Poetry in America" sort of suggests uh, something of that. It's not, it's not sociological or anything, but it's concerned with really how a poet might operate in a society like. I have here, um, yeah, Jean's poem, uh, What the Body Knows, this is the title poem of that book. I don't, I'll just read it. We won't talk about these much, I don't think. Just, just read a few of them. Maybe it's the ocean's rhythmic tug that helps me sleep, my body's own surge remembering its deepest pulse. Think of those Celtic monks who scaled the slippery rocks, carrying vellum and inks while the sea broke and battered beneath them. High in a crevice, a hidden stone hut with cot and candle. The scribe dips and swirls his quill to preserve the story. Luke's genealogy, name after name, letters shaped like birds in every color, a flight of messengers released into history. Each word unfurls the promise like Gabriel kneeling. The body knows that wings, like waves, can break through walls and enter that the secret of the story is love, that even as we sleep, its tides carry us in a wild safety. So there's something very beautiful about that. I think we've talked a fair bit about bodies and what you know, bodily kinds of knowledge and experience here. Um, and yeah. I also have this poem of Julius here, a longer poem called Bat Boy. Break a leg. I don't know if, if you, you can read this here or not, but it's on the handout as well. And I will also read it from the handout. It's also supposed to have uh, indentations, which I didn't manage to reproduce there. A student with two studs in his nose and a dragon tattoo crawling from his collar he seems always ready to swoon from bliss or despair, now flits at my office door. I will look at his poem drawn onto a music score and find nothing to say about chance or HIV. Only later I'll think to tell him the night before I left home, I slept sadly in our old house until a wing touched my cheek tenderly as a breeze. I woke to black fluttering at my feet and a mind fresh from the other side said, don't turn on the light. Don't wake the man. Don't scream or speak. Go back to sleep. The next morning, I remembered that people upstate whack them with tennis rackets. That the Chinese character for good luck resembles the character for bad, both so unsettling and erratic. But it's bad luck to say good luck. And China is on stage where they say break a leg. So delicate bats must be woven into silk brocade and glazed onto porcelain plates. Next morning, I found a big-eared mouse with leather folded under his shoulders, hanging from claws stuck in a screen. All day, my work made me forget, but then I'd remember, passing the window where he slept, shaded under the eaves. He was fine. I was fine. Then at dusk, he was gone suddenly. Pale boy, dressed in black, maybe the best that can be said for any of us is that once we were angelic enough to sleep with strangers. He touched my cheek. I opened the screen. He flew in his time. We did no harm. Isn't that beautiful? You know, I, 
couple of moments in the poem that always get to me. The one is when she says, don't wake the man, don't scream or speak. There's this, because you know what, what usually happens, who, who's had a bat in your house? You know, we've had bats in our house. What do you do? The first thing you do is panic and start yelling, right? And what's the next thing you do? You get the tennis racket or you start whacking at I don't know. I mean, it's always the temptation, right, with anything like this, is to, is to respond uh, violently. And what I love about this poem is just the, the sort of gentleness that it finds, that she's able not to let that fear take over, yeah? And uh, yeah, maybe the best that can be said for any of us is that once we were angelic enough to sleep with strangers. That's such a beautiful line. I, mean, I think we'll take sleep with in the, uh, you know, direct sense rather than the uh, metaphoric sense of that term, right? Right? But, but uh, that, yeah. One of the things that, you know, I think runs through a great deal of Mennonite writing um, is, is trying to figure out what peace actually means, you know, what living it out, not just as not going to war, but in all of these other parts of our lives, in all these other ways, uh, actually means. And for me, this is one of those poems that does that, you know, that just, just trying to ask that question and figure it out. All right, my time is up. I see. Uh, I also have Keith Ratzliff's Kneeling Angel here, which is a great poem, which I will uh, a poem from my book. I tell you what, um, we're running over time. I will read you this poem uh, from my book, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. How's that? Everybody's looking a little droopy, and uh, rightfully so at this point in the day. So um, yeah, I had this uh, book that just came out uh, in the last several months, and this, this is the last poem in the book, and it has my a bit of my childhood uh, in it. It's probably sort of a transgressive poem in certain ways as well, and I will just leave this with you. Lessons of a Gentle Childhood. Under this skylight, many lost things are visible. I see the mighty black and yellow spiders in the iris beds by the old garage and feel not a shred of fear. I could husk two dozen sticky ears of sweet corn and pick two quarts of strawberries on my achy knees without whining once. I could hit four baseballs in a row under the maple trees and over the fence, the only kind of home run that counts in my private game. I could sit through the whole Sunday night service in the stickiest dusk of July and not once imagine committing the unpardonable sin just to see if anything would change. I could sing just as I am thine own to be seven times through and never switch to Mr. Tambourine Man in my head. Never dream of dancing neath the diamond sky just as I am thine own to be. Silhouetted by the sea without a single plea. Hey, hey, I am weary. Play another song for me, an old song that I've never heard. Play it smooth and loud and long. Play the boy who listened too hard. Play the boy with dirt in his nose. Play the boy with the lousy guitar in his arms. Play the boy whose eyes are still closed. Thank you very much.